So, Markham, great to have you with us. Um, super tempting to, to get right into the WWE stuff, but obviously I think it makes more sense to, to figure out the career path you took to get there from, um, from, from the start. So, you know, maybe we could just start with a, a general open up question from there. You know, what is the start of your storytelling or, or media career? It goes way back. So I started in media. It goes back to when I was about 16 and I, I decided I loved photography. And I uh, went and bought a camera with a with friend, uh, with the help of a friend of my parents, who's a landscape photographer called Giles Norman. And he just guided me along with a, with a meager budget I had, put a camera in my hand, and then I was off. And I grew up near the sea in Dunleary, um, doing a lot of sailing. And, and that was that was how I ended, ended up in media. It was through sailing photography of all things. Uh, being out in boats, taking photos, doing reports on what was happening out on, uh, on Dublin Bay and around the country. And age 16, just pestered my way into a magazine and said, you know, print my photos, print my photos, print my photos. And it being a small magazine, uh, the boss said, well, they're, they're fine photos, but I don't know what happened. So tell me the story. So I ended up writing and shooting the photos. And that was kind of my in. And uh, I just kind of ran with it and, and, and basically tried to get published as much as I physically could between then and when, and when I left college. But it was a great kind of place to cut your teeth because, you know, I had to do everything from, you know, finding my own stories, creating all the imagery, but then also pulling in all this uh, other material from around the country. So I learned how to sub edit, learned how to do some basic layout. And it was one of those, I think it set the trend for me, uh, being aware of many hats, someone who was just willing to, to muck in and get involved in every aspect of, of the business. And, and so after that then, you, did, uh, you mentioned a couple of tours and detours along the way. Uh, can, you, can you tell us about those? Yeah, I mean, um, stayed, I, I was always there with, with storytelling, you know, friends of mine were, were off doing, working in bars or whatever, but for me, it was always about uh, teaching, about storytelling. I ended up in, in newspapers, took a couple of detours educationally, I did law, I did development studies, went back to journalism, and then ended up in, in the newspaper business working for Metro Ireland in Dublin. Um, did a very short stint there, because this girl convinced me to go traveling around the world. And my next job ended up being deputy editor of a newspaper in Australia, uh, where we landed there in Sydney and lived for a little while. And then that was when the kind of real, I think the real handbrake turn uh, happened because I'd been working for magazines, freelance, and I'd be working for newspapers, freelance in Ireland, and tinkering with the kind of very beginnings of websites at that point. Um, I have my own website and then uh, I had to come home for two years and run an embroidery business of all things. My, my father passed away and this was 2008 at the beginning of the, the recession and literally left me a, a manufacturing business to learn and run from scratch, which was a kind of crazy time to step away from a career which that was just beginning to kind of build momentum. Um, but went back to Dublin from Sydney, I ran that for two years. Uh, kept it afloat, didn't lose any jobs, kept the doors open and, and passed on and sold it. And then kind of stood looking at the media landscape, which had been basically decimated because in those two years, not only had the recession uh, wiped clean budgets, but uh, the internet had, you know, had rampaged through the business as well and slashed ad revenues and the whole, the whole landscape had, had really changed pretty dramatically. Um, luckily, I on the side, I'd been, you know, keeping my, my, my foot in the door, doing a little bit of freelancing uh, and doing a lot of online stuff. So playing with websites, blogging, which was kind of the, I was a, a nascent blogging community in Ireland, but a very, very well integrated one and very, very welcoming. And so I got pulled into uh, this company called Storyful by a friend, a guy called Gavin Sheridan. Uh, who literally just wanted me to come in and, and spend a couple of days testing a CMS and see if they had kind of the bones of something that that made sense to what they were trying to do. And that was October 2010. And I didn't leave. I kind of hung around and we, we started building something out together and then spent three years with them uh, building Storyful into what was basically the world's first social media news agency. Um, and did three years with them and, and that got sold to News Corp. But uh, that was a kind of fascinating journey that uh, um, propelled me from being a newspaper journalist in a very traditional sense to being right in the cutting edge of where digital news was going. 
And, and I guess what's, what's interesting there, you know, you, you mentioned that working in an embroidery business, do you feel like the journalism background served you? I mean, business no. maybe is... is no, <laughs> not the slightest. <laughs> not about asking the right um, questions. No, I mean, the right story. It, it, I guess, it, I mean, it, the interesting thing about journalism is that you're, you're just trying to learn something every day. Every day you, you start with a blank slate and you have to figure out a story and you have to figure out people and you have to try and get into um, what's inter interesting about them, what's the best story that you can tell uh, on their behalf and how do you engage an audience. And uh, I think with embroidery, yeah, it, it certainly was very different. And uh, it was, for me, it was a crash course in business. It wasn't necessarily transferable, but what it did give me with that a lot, not a lot of journalists have is a kind of appreciation of what small business is like, what you really have to do to keep things afloat and uh, and just how, how hard you have to graft every day to, in a very, very real sense. But I think journalism can be actually quite disconnected from the real world in, in a lot of ways. And journalists can get very, very disconnected from it. So um, having spent two years at an incredibly tough time doing something where uh, I was just learning it as I went, basically, with no real business background. That was, it was invaluable. It's, it is not the way I would recommend anyone learn business. Um, but it was, you know, a real crash course and something that I still carry lessons from to this day. Sure, sure. Uh, and I guess, you know, what's interesting to remember as we kind of, as we move into the, the storyful story and just to set some context, you have, you know, the news that had been um, pretty traditional, long form, you know, journalists creating their own stories with perhaps less feedback from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, but now we had, you know, social media, which had been there for a couple of years, but was kind of transforming in terms of the, the deliverability of news and, and how people were, were finding it. Um, was that kind of where your, you know, your digital journalism career started? Would you say there was like a significant difference between you know, the end of the old journalism career, the beginning of the new kind of journalism career focused on social media? Yeah, no, it was pretty clear cut. Like, um, it was interesting, but when I was back in Australia, I, I signed up for Twitter purely to keep track of the Irish elections because it kind of came to, you know, came to, came of ages as, as a medium around that point. And as I was working in business, I was using it for marketing. I was using it for connecting with people. But at Storyful, that was when... And it's almost hard to imagine right now, you know, at this point, because this was when social media was brand new. People didn't understand it. They didn't understand what you could and, and couldn't trust. They didn't understand how the information was trafficked and how you could figure out, you know, the, the source of it. And, and that's what we kind of dove into. And um, we were a bunch of people and we kind of assembled a bunch of people, almost like the A team who you know, you could throw them in a shed with a couple of spanners and some sheet metal and they come out with a tank. It was basically people who, who understood and could see the opportunity in the platforms and could see where it was all going to go and it could see how you could pull together a bunch of nascent free tools to just pull apart the internet and find the best pieces. And I think with Storyful, there was, there was that mentality, which was, you know, um, find new things, innovate, try them, test them, see what works and, and do that on a kind of daily basis. So it was that mentality. But there was also this, this kind of macabre timing because at the time that we were figuring it out and we were figuring it out quicker than, than anyone else in the business at the time, uh, the, the Arab Spring kicked off. And the fascinating thing about that was that you had this enormous news event kicking off at the same time that there had just been an explosion in mobile phones and it was they just got to the level where you could broadcast, you could use them to live stream, you could use them to take photos and share it. So we had this, uh, this revolution that was spreading across the, the Southern Mediterranean and all the way to the, through the Middle East and this enormous volume of content coming out of it. So for us, there was a huge appetite in the news industry to understand what's going on. They, they couldn't get in. They couldn't get close to the action, but we had these people with phones in their hands and we started building relationships with them all digitally, all remotely. And um, we started building just databases of who they were. We started cross verifying where, where did it all come from? And, you know, we started being, we became the people who could do that at scale and at 
piece better than anyone else could. And when you when you do that, which is probably the hardest puzzle to to put together that, that the news industry has ever seen, um, everything else kind of seemed a little bit easier. So uh, building a news news business kind of from the Arab Spring out was was how Storyful um, how Storyful grew and how it came to prominence. And we just started kept we kept pulling in people with the same mindset. We kept pulling in these people who had an eye for detail, but also had an understanding of what was what was kind of bubbling up on the internet at the time. I mean, you know, Storyful has been one of the, the great Irish startup success stories. Um, and, and I guess, you know, like you mentioned early on, it started the focus on, you know, finding those people that were close to the news. Um, but there was kind of a, you know, a pivot then that, that happened about, well, I guess, first of all, you had these relatively new news sources in that you had Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, you know, <laughs> I remember growing up, like, you know, your, your parents would always tell you, you never trust anything you believe online. And yet, you know, here we have Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and they are becoming like the repository for, for getting our news kind of nowadays. How did, how did that happen? How did they be, you know, how did they come to the forefront of, of where we get our news, I guess? Well, I think that the conversational nature of Twitter was where we all gravitated to first, because you could have these conversations and you could, um, Twitter more so than any others, you could, you could do interesting things with. It wasn't just about, um, about the people and about the content, but it was about the data. It was about what was behind each tweet. You know, there was, I think even early on, there was about 15 or 16 data points in the metadata of each, of each tweet. And we would start pulling that kind of, that kind of information apart. And that's what made it very, what made some of it verifiable. Um, I think what what allowed it grow, or what what the likes of Zuckerberg and and um, and, and Jack and all of the others saw was just this hunger for for making connections in new ways, and they tapped into that. And from the from a news perspective, and a news gathering perspective, that was what was so attractive about it was you could find the guy who was right beside whatever had just happened within seconds. You could you could get news of an earthquake that had happened thousands of miles away while people were still feeling the ground shake underneath their feet and, and reach out to them and have them talk to you about it and tell you, and, and tell you exactly what was happening. And that was brand new. And um, if, if, if you were in news gathering, it was manna from heaven. So you just, you just dove right in and that's what we did. Um, how do we get to where we are now? I think it's just, um, News, news gatherers may have been the first to realize it in that sense, but there was obviously this, this other side to them, which was just the social connection of, hey, I want to share what's going on in my life with you, and I want to share that with a whole bunch of other people. And then, well, look at this, I can probably monetize this and make a career out of it. And that's where you have the likes of YouTubers who are making hundreds of thousands, if not millions, off, you know, just having a YouTube account and connecting with an audience, understanding what that audience wants and and connecting with them on a daily basis. So it's this phenomenally rapid evolution of, of platforms just hooking into this human need to connect. And, and Storyful was, was, of course, you know, right there at the center, you know, the pioneer in, in sourcing this news information. I guess, you know, you mentioned about the speed of the platform then, and I think if mm -hmm. you're referencing the, the Costa Rica uh, earthquake. So you could see that, you know, you're moving into a new paradigm where journalists find this information instantly. Um, but then, you know, what happens if the, if the information is false? So I, I'm kind of interested as well. Like there's a, you know, there's obviously a trade off about being first, uh -huh. but then, but then being accurate. Um, mm -hmm. You know, did, did you kind of, did you see that then as well, where some organizations just wanted to be first with the news? Yeah, I think, I think that's a trade off as old as time, you know, that, uh, Everyone wants to be first, but you don't want to be the first to be wrong. And anyone who's who's made that mistake once in their career will try never to make it again. And I think you know a lot of a lot of us as journalists have done that. Um, yeah, we start we saw that very early on. And what we started trying to do was build internal systems, both human and technological, that that helped us avoid that pitfall. So there was uh, I, I go back to Gab Sheridan, who was one of those kind of founding members, and what Gab was. He had a very interesting mind. We, he, he converted us all to become data nerds and he saw all of this incoming information as not just content, but a stream of data. 
And so we pulled in, we pulled in a, a couple of engineers to just help us build, build tools and build dashboards to funnel all these streams of data in interesting ways to help us figure out like what is a signal, what is a signal, and what's a, what's a real signal versus a false positive. And so we built um, a whole bunch of internal systems that would uh, use lists on Twitter and use other kind of groups on Facebook to create maps of signals and create heat maps of signals. And they were our go-to tools for finding stuff that was that was going on anywhere in the world or within interest groups or within subject matter groups um and it, you know that that helped us uh, and that helped us be first to the signal and then we would just apply some very traditional journalistic methods to figure out right is this noise or is it an actual signal and filter out the the kind of the the, the crap really from what was actually real and what was helping us understand what was happening and that was the value for our for our customers, which was news organizations around the world. It wasn't just we'll get you stuff quick. It's we'll get you the content quick that you can trust so that you are the people who are out there first with the right information as opposed to, you know, going out there with something that might cause more misinformation. I, you know, one of the interesting stories that um, you told in, in your TED talk previously was about the Hama incident, which you know, you'd, you'd gotten a certain level of information, but then, you know, there had been kind, kind of conflicting stories and you had to verify how it was true. Mm -hmm. But you did manage to, to do that. Um, can you can you talk us through that process a little bit? Uh, I mean, so this, the, the example is, it was basically a video of a bunch of guys throwing bodies out of the back of a pickup truck off a bridge into a river in Syria during the war. And I think one thing to note here is that this is the kind of stuff that we were verifying on a daily basis myself and Maliki Brown who's now at the New York Times and uh, and Gav and, and other people who've gone to work in places like the International Criminal Court. We'd spend hours kind of poring over these videos that were pretty critical to the story of what was happening in Syria, just looking for any kind of detail that would give us a clue as to where it had happened, what we could tell. And you were looking for the most subtle tells. You were looking for the angle of a shadow of a curb, or you're looking for a minaret in the distance that you could then go to Google Maps and find to kind of cross-reference that, yeah, this in fact was a video. Um, you were looking for uh, time of day references and weather that you could go back and tie to weather reports, because some, some groups were trying to put out information saying it happened on Tuesday, but actually it was from years ago. We even found some guys putting out a video claiming to be Syrian Syrian army uh, officers um, beheading people with a chainsaw. And in fact, that video had come from Mexico and was five years old. So you're, you're pulling every, every tool you could together to just, to just verify it. And we spent a day tracing a river upstream for miles on, on Google Maps um, to see you know, what direction the water was flowing in and, and was the bank the right shape and trying to find every bridge. until so we found the one that these guys were, were throwing bodies off. Um, which was, uh, you know, a process that uh, was mind-numbing, was madly frustrating, but then when you finally got as close to the truth as you could, it was pretty satisfying. And, and you know, when you say verifying information, then obviously you had resources like Google Maps, but these, these tools are generally available on the internet, you know, largely for free, right? Th these are tools that organizations should be making use of, you'd, you'd think. Yeah, but it's that old thing of, you know, uh, you might hire some guy to come and fix, fix something in your house and he, he twists one screw and he charges you $1,000 and you break down, you know, break down the bill and it's a dollar for twisting the screw and 999 for knowing, you know, which screw to twist. Mm -hmm. And that was largely it. It was, you've all these free tools. How do you use them? How do you deploy them? And uh, what's unique about the, the sequence in which you put them to use? And there's also the element of you've got to bring some investigative news to it and you've got to bring some critical thinking. And we were a bunch of people who who understood what was happening in the countries as well. We were very tuned to the different groups that play, the different subtleties of what was happening in any region. So there is so many layers of nuance to every in investigation that it's not the kind of thing that uh, you could just say, well, you know, we've got a 25 year old who's got a Flickr account and has got a Twitter account and can open Google Maps. You have to very, you have to equip them with the knowledge of here are all those things that these platforms can do that you don't really realize. Now go and put them to use. 
and, and I guess you know that was kind of the uh, you know the, the the pivot in the business model for Storyful then as well. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, you can hire all these people to uh, to find out this information, or you could go to a, an organization like Storyful, who would would verify that that information at scale then, right? That's it. I mean, it's hard to build a team like this, and I think more organizations have them now because it's become a bit, become a bit more it's become a bit more mainstream. And I think um, we've done a lot of talks like this where we've talked through the processes and, and the procedures. So, um, and also people are just more more savvy with the, the tools that are on the internet, and there's there's more available to them. So, back in the day, though, yes, we were. I think Stories will probably remain to this day a an amazing service for anyone who doesn't have the capacity to build a team like that in-house and you know we uh, the, the interesting thing about Storyful was even though we were we consider ourselves the best at what we did news is a small market and the, the budgets and the margins are tight so the pivot was actually you know uh, how do we get this business to a point where it's got more than just a news offering to sustain itself how do we how do we figure out what else there is of value within what we're doing that we can that we can create some some much more stable recurring revenue? And when we got to that point, things got really interesting because what we found was as we as we went to try and find all this content and we built these discovery mechanisms that would serve up like thousands of videos a day for us to look at. There was just so much of this content that was oh that's that's interesting, but it's not news. That's interesting, but it's not news. And we were digging, we were digging for coal all day in the news business and throwing away the diamonds, not really realizing what we have, we had. And then when Storyful decided, well, actually a lot of this content, it's not news, it's not hard news. It's not coming from Syria or wherever, um, but it's going to fill a minute and a half on Good Morning America. It's going to be the viral video that, that uh, they close the show with and, and makes people feel warm and fuzzy after having gone through a horrendous investigation. And they want it and they want to know that they can find the person behind it and they want to know that they can find that they can clear it and get the rights to it that's a that's a pretty viable business so why don't we do both and one helps support the other and then i built a whole bunch of kind of other other enterprises within storyful where we reached out to google and we did some election integrity projects with them there was um it was budget to build open journalism projects where we were the kind of focus point for collaborative journalism. And when you pull all those things together, Storyful started to look a lot more viable. And uh, that's when people started looking to buy it. And, you know, you, you speak about some of the, uh, the successes. Well, obviously the success that Storyful was, but, you know, it seems to be such a a great incubator of talent, right? You've got Maliki mm -hmm. Brown, who's, who's done amazing things at New York Times. Uh, Donny O'Sullivan, who I, I just see all the time now on uh, on CNN, just do more great work. Um, you know, it, it, it seems like too many data points to be a coincidence that there were such great people there. You know, what was it about the organization or um, that, I guess, brought in such great people? Was it, you know, was it an Irish education system in journalism? Was it, was there something unique? Was there some secret sauce to, uh, you know, finding those great people? I think, um, I think the mission of, of the company was one that attracted people and, and made it easy to find the right people, which was, you know, let's do something that no one has ever done in journalism. Let's do it really well. Um, and let's do it, do it in Dublin, which is where we were. And, I, you know, there was a moment this, uh, this summer where I was back in Dublin and we all kind of got together, all of the alums, because Malachi Brown, who, if you, if you don't know Malachi, he's now a uh, senior producer in the Visual Investigations Unit at the New York Times. Mal won a Pulitzer this year. And so we all got on Zoom just to kind of catch up and basically congratulate and celebrate what he had done. And it was that kind of gathering of talent. And it was a bunch of people who were, um, on the whole, low ego. They were willing to collaborate. They were not precious about getting stuff wrong or being told there was a better way to do things. They were just hungry to learn, hungry to do better, and hungry to um, figure out ways that they could be part of something innovative, that they could contribute to it. And they were willing to do that at the lowest level if need be. Um, we didn't have any bylines, no one was getting credit. So in order to 
to tolerate that, you had to be someone who was just who, who loved doing it and who just wanted to be part of it and was willing to wear a lot of hats. Like I, I we joke about saying that, but during my time at Storyful, I was the lawyer at one point because I was the only person with a law degree and we didn't have budget for a solicitor. I was uh, I shot and directed the the first promo video we ever did for Storyful using my SLR and bouncing light off the back of an old whiteboard that had some foil on the back because we couldn't afford lighting. Um, I went out and did business development, selling stuff in to you know, visiting newsrooms in New York and London. Um, it was a it was a great place to be incubated as a journalist and. Yeah, it's fun. I had a lot of great people who went on to do phenomenal things. Mm -hmm. And and so I guess from there, then you know, Storyful was sold to to News Corp. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's when you looked to you know across the Atlantic, looked to the U.S. Yeah, I got I got an offer from an interesting a, a startup out here in New York called Vocative, which was trying to do something interesting again. It was a it, it was. Uh, an Israeli um, entrepreneur who had made his money in the security space. He wanted to hand some technology over to a bunch of journalists and see what they could do do with it. So they pulled me across to to be the managing editor and try and wrangle a team in Tel Aviv, um, mix that that team of analysts who are all ex-military up with a, a bunch of very traditional magazine journalists from New York and just see what we could create. And uh, had a very you know, tumultuous but interesting three years there of trying to make that work, uh, going through what was a cliched pivot at the time to, to video, um, built a data journalism team there as part of that whole uh, rebrand of the company and worked with some of the most incredible journalists that I've, that I've worked with. Actually, ironically, some of them went on to work for Storyful in this, in this latest iteration, um, but worked with people who had been fact checkers at The Guardian, the New, the, the New York Times, Vanity Fair, Newsweek, a, a really interesting bunch. Uh, and that was my kind of grounding in American journalism, which is a very, very different beast from what I learned in Ireland. And uh, I, I see that, you know, your your position there was was head of visual storytelling. Yeah. Um, and uh, another kind of key point was that the evocative audience was 80% mobile. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I guess, just not something I considered as a you know uh, ignorant person in finance and not all of that familiar with media and journalism but when you talk about wearing so many hats then you kind of have to be a design pro as well right because you know you don't have the uh, the broadsheet space to use or you don't have like a, a web you know a big web page or your I guess your audience are increasingly finding their news on smaller and smaller devices so how you tell those stories has become increasingly important and how you present that information as well. Yeah, so we had an interesting team that would basically crank out data sets all day and um, we would set them off with a, with a question or problem and they would come back with, you know, with reams of data for us to figure out how to present. And yeah, when you have, when you have an audience that literally is, is, you know, I think attention poor and has, they want something that's gonna perform quickly, uh, it's gonna fill the screen in the palm of their hand, um, our job was to make sure that when, when they scrolled past whatever we created, that it was arresting, but it told a story like almost at a glance every time. And that was kind of our MO for that, for that visual storytelling unit was, you have a screen of space, that's all you have, get your point across, take people deeper into the story every single time that they see the, see the graphic look and feel that we had. And um, it was, uh, I mean, we, we were, I think I can't remember how many we turned out. We must turn out about ten or fifteen graphics a day. Um, of some of them were tried and tested designs. Some of them were things that we were creating on the fly. And very enjoyable time. It was always interesting. I think bringing forward the, the data skills that I learned from Gavin Storyful and developed there. Um, got very in the weeds on how to clean data, how to how to parse it, but then also understanding what the audience was engaging with. So going deep into the analytics and, and trying to figure out, right, if we, if we do this right, where's the traffic coming from? How can I, how can I grow that audience? How can I deliver more of what they want and, and increase the, all the metrics that make sense for us to, to make sure that our, our stuff is engaging with them. Mm -hmm. and, and after Vocative then three years there, looked at um, maybe slightly different angle, um, little change in the career again. Uh, with CBS, right? CBS was fascinating because 
I'd gone from um, two digital startups to one of the, you know, the, the most legacy, most uh, old fashioned in a lot of ways, news organizations in, in New York, but an iconic American brand, the home of, um, of Edward R. Murrow and the home of, you know, some of the most storied journalists in American, in American media, Cronkite, et cetera. And I landed at CBS the day before the 2016 election. So election night was day two of, uh, on the job there. And my remit there was um, grow, grow the audience for not just cbsnews.com, but CBSN, which was the, the streaming OTT news service that, that CBS had, which ran across, um, I think by the, end of, by the time I left, about 13 different platforms. Uh, operating 24-7, and it became a, a really significant crutch for, for CBS as a news organization because unlike CNN or MSNBC, CBS doesn't have a 24-7 operation. So when they needed to go live with breaking news and they needed to have an outlet for it, we were it. We were the, we were the place that they, we were the, the, the platform that they turned to. And we were also, I think, the test bed for how do we connect uh, aging audiences and, and audiences that are um, that are attached to legacy media properties. How do we reach them in new ways, and how do we take all that content and and make sure it traffics and make sure it gets to the younger generation, but also you know people who just have different behavior sets, people who are not in front of their TVs at six thirty at night uh, and between seven and nine in the morning. How do we reach them all day, or when they when they need stuff the most? Um, and there was one you know. One thing we became very, very adept at was being quick and accurate at hurricane coverage because there was, you know, there was that season where you just have hurricane after hurricane, and we started to see all of our metrics shift. Uh, the minute we started covering a hurricane, our, uh, our our audience in that region would shoot up, and it would all be mobile, and we started realizing that it was people who were forced out of their homes and people who wanted someone who was dedicating coverage to, to the, the hurricane. And they might be in their car, or they might be stuck in traffic on a, on a highway trying to, you know, on one of the escape routes. And we got feedback from them that they were watching, they were turning to CBSN because they knew we were covering it and they knew they could, they could get us for free without a, a network subscription on whatever device they had with them. So as long as they had battery, they had news. And um, so two and a half years with, with CBS, Trying to trying to basically break records for them with their audience and trying to, you know, just get their news to thousands more people every day. And so, I guess when you when you are at an organization the size of CBS, you know, how how do you look at the audience? You know, how do you how do you kind of break down some of those channels? Figure out, you know, who's best to serve, what kind of content, and and where. How how do you, how do you look at those sort of things? Well, it's more that there's 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 so many different audiences. There's not just one. There's there every behavior set is an audience, and every every story has its own audience. It's a matter of just figuring out how to connect one to the other, and the the audience will be different depending on what the on what the content was or what the topic was. Like health and parenting content would fly for us on the Apple News platform, but it would fall flat everywhere else um, for whatever reason. So we would make sure that whenever we had a good health news story, that's where we went to, to make sure that we were connecting with the people with whom it resonated. Um, and it was little pockets like that that you were always trying to open up to, to figure out, well, this is, this is an interesting group. They're definitely interested in this topic. We'll, we'll super serve in this particular way on this particular platform. Um, and then it, it, you know, it was a matter of, well, what are, what are also the behaviors that we're serving? What times of day do we think that we can um, serve people better? And shifting things around in our linear schedule and the, in the, to 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 test that and to see if we go an hour earlier, how does that impact the rest of the day and does it start to establish a behavior that people actually realize? Well, these guys are are up earlier than the rest. Well, I'll turn my TV on, my my Apple TV or my Roku, whatever it is, and I'll stay with them for the morning. And then you get the split over audience. So you're always just looking for a connection, a behavior. Um, and then to do a lot of work with SEO, the questions, how do you answer a question? How do you understand what questions get asked at what time? And then you're there, you meet that need, you, you're, you're there when they need you with the answer. It, it's, you know, it seems like your role there was, you know, actually 
you know, very entrepreneurial again, despite perhaps being a big organization, you know, it was pulling together the product specialists, the engineers, the marketers, I'm guessing, um, journalists, all to, to build this uh, internally again, right? So, you know, perhaps is that, is that the kind of, you know, the, the Markham story, like the continual entrepreneurial um, building of products and services within an organization? I think so. It's you're just trying to find like you're trying to find an opportunity to make a difference, um, which seems like a really cliche thing to say. But you're just looking for when you go into a company like that. It's it's huge. It's already a juggernaut. Um, how do you find an opportunity to make to make something better, to make a, make a difference, and make a make a noticeable difference? And often it comes down to diplomacy and just a willingness to find people who are the advocates for what you're trying to trying to achieve or who want, who want to do the same thing they want to make a difference want to change something and you make alliances across different business units and you because that's what it was right it was in, in you know it's storyful and evocative in cbs i was trying to bring a digital mindset to people who were in, in slightly more legacy operations so in storyful we would go into channel four or we go into bbc and we just helped them understand what we were building and how we could help them. Um, in, in Vocative, it was trying to merge two cultures, one of um, military intelligence gathering and, um, and journalistic facts, you know, fact finding and, and fact checking. And um, one which was purely technical and one which was purely storytelling and merged the two. And then CBS, it was, it was the broadcast digital divide going to shows like CBS This Morning and 60 Minutes and saying, you've got amazing storytelling here, but you're only reaching one of your audiences. We want to reach the other 19 that we know exist and find another 20 for you along the way. And it's a pretty compelling offering when you, when you say to someone, we're going to explode your viewership. You're going to have to be a little bit uncomfortable where it comes from initially, but it's, it's going to work. And it's been fascinating having been gone from there for, for quite a while now, looking back and seeing things that I, like seeing the seeds that I planted come to fruition. Like I, I remember when we were trying to get that across the line and it's great to see that someone else has picked it up and run with it and, and it's got there. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that is it. It's, it's, you're just trying to find, you're trying to find a way to get something interesting done every time. And that's what keeps you interested. Otherwise you're just going to get bored. And I guess when you, when you phrase it like that, then looking at your position at WWE, that was probably a natural progression then, right? Or was it a bit of a career pivot for you? It was, it was a career pivot in that, yeah, it's, it's not in news anymore. It, we're, not in, we're not in Kansas anymore, that's for sure. It's a very, very different thing. And, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the kind of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial thing you put your finger on, I think, is it that, you know, CBS was definitely where I found scale and I found kind of started to un understand what scale allowed you achieve uh, because we were dealing with, you know, billions of page views for, for the first time ever. It was, you know, I think we did 4 billion page views in, in the, the second year that I was there, um, which was huge. And, and we were matching that with like a million streams a day on video. So that was big. And then I, when the, the WWE opportunity cropped up, the, the roles were actually very similar, but what WWE offered was uh, a, a different way to deploy that scale because in the news business, you don't get ready to play and innovate as much as you want to with, uh, with platforms or with commercial partners, just because of the nature of the ethics of journalism and wanting to, wanting to seem you know, pure and unsullied and, and uninfluenced by any kind of external factors. And when you go to somewhere commercial like WWE, that is, you know, part of what they do is just how can we how can we put smiles on faces all around the world, but how can we do so by um, pushing our partners to innovate and, and bringing new things to market? That was a whole new world for me, and that was kind of where I wanted to be. So, moved across to the entertainment world, and it's been I mean it's been a roller coaster. Obviously, didn't see COVID coming at the time that I joined WWE, but um, you know. I, the, the moment that I was sold on it, I think, uh, was I joined in, <laughs> I joined CPS the day before the election. I joined WWE the week after WrestleMania. And as part of my onboarding, they said, here's two tickets, go to WrestleMania. And it was at MetLife Stadium in, uh, in New Jersey. And I was just blown away. I got there 
probably feeling a little bit unsure of what I just got myself into. And I turned up at the stadium and I was waiting for my friend to arrive. And I've just never seen a crowd that was so happy. And I could, you know, usually there's an element of tension, I think, outside the stadium, but this was the most diverse group of people I'd ever seen. There was people from like six years old to, to their 80s, every race, color, creed, shape, size, the works, just hooting and screaming and every single one of them full of joy to be there. And I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon and I left, I'm oh, sorry, 4.30 in the afternoon and I left, I think at, uh, I got home about 2 a.m. And the stadium was full until one in the morning. Like no, nobody left. Everyone stuck around pretty much the entire thing. And, uh, you know, interestingly, two Irish superstars were the final wrestlers in the two biggest match of the, of the night. Um, but I, I was sold. Like, this was the spectacle. I, I got it. I understood why it had become such a juggernaut and why people just engaged with it so much. Yeah, you know, you, when you, you bring up about the diversity of the audience, I mean, I remember tu tuning in when I was young as, like, 11, 12-year-old boy trying to get home from mass quick in a small sleepy town in Waterford so I could, you know, get my catch up uh, at, at the at the weekend. Um, I can't imagine I had too much in common back then with, you know, members of, of the audience as well. But, you know, how do you create compelling stories, I guess, that, you know, and, and measure the emotions and feedback of your audience and give them all something that everyone will love? Well, the storylines I can't take credit for. I mean, the that's part of what has kept WWE alive is the strength of the narratives, the way that they, you know, the way that they listen to the feedback from the audience and 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 build that into how the the how the stories are told, how characters are developed, and how um, how we go from event to event and 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 string the narratives along all the way. I think that's the, one of the most fascinating things about it is people don't necessarily think of WWE as, as storytelling, but it's it's storytelling in, in its purest form because it's it's battles of good and evil and it's 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 the characters you love and the characters you love to hate, you know, duking it out um, week after week. Um, and it, it's universal and you, you say you might not have that much in common, but like I got into a taxi one night on, uh, um, at the far end of Long Island, I was coming back um, I was actually coming back from work to, to Long Island that night for some reason and I got chatting to the driver and he was from Nepal and we were chatting away and he asked what I did and I told him and he was like oh my goodness and he just started going off on a riff about Goldberg who was one of our legacy talents and he just was telling me about how huge Goldberg was in Kathmandu and how all his friends would just you know loved him would you know would do whatever they could to see all of Goldberg's matches and it kind of blew me away because it was one of those touch points you don't expect with with a with a, a real super fan and there he was mm -hmm. just delighted to be chatting about this with this kind of stuff you know and he'd been hooked since he was a kid and then yeah, and I, I'm, sorry I mean the, the boring boring part of it is we measure it like any organization measures the things now we take every data point we possibly can from social media we have focus groups, we have, you know, we just reach out to our, the huge audience that we have to figure out how they're reacting to everything that we do. And, and we, we try and do more of the stuff that they love and we try and do less of the stuff that they, they're not so sure about. And, and just, you know, to, to put some of those numbers in context for anyone uh, that's on the call that's not aware, you know, 1.5 million subscribers on the WWE Network, 65 million subscribers on the YouTube channel, uh, it's like a billion more followers across the social media accounts, 48 billion views across YouTube. I mean, it it is a substantial, I mean, it's a juggernaut, really. Yeah, it's huge. 800 million homes around the world in 180 countries. Um, an average week, we'll see somewhere north of 1.5 billion minutes of WWE content consumed across our, our digital platforms. So it's it's a behemoth. It's a it's a phenomenal, um, phenomenal company that just continues to grow and continues to find new new ways to connect which is the most you know the fun thing like I, I i come in every day and i don't know what is going to be the, the the next challenge where we're going to be is it going to be india is it going to be stuff that we're launching in latin america um there's something going on every day to try and uh, to just try and serve you know, a, a different audience 
couple of Irish entrepreneurs that are, are on the call here or will be listening afterwards. Um, how do you figure out the monetization strategy a little bit then for that? You know, when you look at yeah. kind of all the, the different audience segments, um, how do you how do you drive those those monetization channels? Uh, we just have a lot of different we have a lot of different channels and a lot of different funnels to fill. You know, um, the ones that I'm directly responsible for the the likes of the the WWE network is an interesting one. We have both the the SVOD aspect and the AVOD aspect. So for uh, you know that's advertising uh, VOD, advertising driven VOD, and and, and a subscription driven VOD. So the WWE network is one and a half million subscribers, each paying nine ninety nine a month for access to what is effectively Netflix for for wrestling. It's eleven thousand hours of wrestling content, new stuff being added every week, um, documentaries, you know, podcasts, um, in ring action from Raw, SmackDown, and NXT, and then all of our our big pay per view events. And that's a big part of it. That's the big kind of recurring revenue stream. YouTube is an enormous revenue stream for us. We have departments dealing with our um, our, our merchandising. Our www.shop.com is is a kind of a, a juggernaut in itself. Um, and then when you know during the time that we have our live events live, obviously ticket sales. We're doing whatever we can to to help deploy all of our platforms to to drive tickets uh, ticket sales for the live events. And then pulling together packages, but I mean that's only that's only the tip of the iceberg because there is also all the different deal structures for TV. Um, there's just there's so many limbs to it, and it's one of the, the kind of fascinating things that this, this company has become a, a, an enormous matrixed corporate company, um, but it's still agile every day. It still manages to pivot to new things on a constant basis um, and find new ways to. I think to, to certainly, you know, make some money out of what we do, which is, is create this kind of entertainment at minimum three nights a week. Touching on the point you mentioned about how quickly you can pivot, I think the one thing that was certainly stood out to me was WrestleMania 36. Uh -huh. so, you know, earlier this year, you had the impact of the coronavirus, you know, uh, felt throughout the world. Uh, the entertainment industry, you know, like many other industries, very hard hit. Uh, you film sets shutting down. Broadway says it's closing its doors until 2021. They said again this week that they were going to extend it out, you know, for another six months again, I think. Yeah. Um, I, not only, you know, were, was WrestleMania kind of important to the fans, um, but in a time when companies are facing significant financial pressure, uh, you know, this is obviously one of the big generators for WWE as well. It was, you know, accounted for like 17 million uh, in revenues last year. So, you know, I, I guess, <laughs> how did this story or strategy evolve around WrestleMania 36? Was there a sense of like, the, the show can't go on in this case? Or was it always, we actually, we know what we need to do. We have the digital presence now. So this makes sense for us. Well, the, the show was always going to go on, but I think it got to a point where there was a realization that it couldn't go on in the stadium in, in Tampa. And that was that was the point where the creativity kicked into gear. It was how do we make sure that this show is as compelling as it as it can be, despite the fact that we can't fill a stadium with almost a hundred thousand, you know, um of the, the WWE universe. And um at that point where we were at that point where no one was in the office anymore. People were working from home from the middle of March. We had two or three weeks to WrestleMania. I went home to, to Ireland and ended up um, directing what I could from the, the, the couch of a barred house in Harold's Cross. And meanwhile, our creative team were figuring out, you know, we were lucky in a way because in the same way that the NA, NBA has its bubble uh, that they created down in Florida, also down in Florida, we had um, the WWE's Performance Center, which is, um, is the home for the training of all our kind of future superstars and all of the guys who... Um, they, that's where they do all their in-ring training. That's where they practice. It's a, it's a huge facility. And it's also um, that complex is where we film NXT. So we had somewhere that we could retreat to and go, right, this is our, this is our safe space. Let's bring everyone back to base and, and we'll do it. But um, the difference became, you know, how do we create something that's as compelling um, given that we're not going to have an audience and we're not going to be in a stadium. And I think the, the two things that were, were very different were we split it over two nights um, so WrestleMania became a two-night affair. 
which meant it wasn't going to be a long eight hour drawn out thing because no one will sit on a couch for eight hours and watch the same thing. And then there was the two kind of cinematic style matches, um, which were the climaxes of each night. One, which was uh, The Undertaker versus um, AJ Styles. And then you had John Cena and Bray Wyatt. And it was just like nothing that WWE had ever done before because it broke, the, broke all the rules. It wasn't two guys in a ring uh, or, you know, in the stands. It was, it was something completely creative that took all the best elements of, of, the, of WWE and just wrapped it in a cinematically styled story. And uh, I don't think anyone was really sure how it was going to go, being frank, because it had never been done before. It was a big risk. Um, and it, it blew everyone away. I mean, it was literally um, like nothing anyone had ever seen. And there was elements of, of slapstick and it being over the top, but it was, it was enormously well received. And uh, I think everyone within the organization, you know, given the circumstances and given COVID and given all the challenges that we faced, I don't think it could have gone any better. Yeah, I was I was on the uh, the WWE subreddit, and um, people were giving it glowing reviews, and they said you could hear the slaps a lot better as well. So that was <laughs> that was one thing that seemed to to stand out for people. So, but but you know that's interesting. I guess you, you know is this is this something that the entertainment industry needs to keep an you know kind of embrace now? I guess we don't know the trajectory of of what the the pandemic means um how can organizations think more about engaging their audiences but in an, an online an online setting is there is there kind of some broad uh, recommendations you'd make or of what has or what hasn't worked i mean for us that was the first fix right that that uh, that wrestlemania was right at the cusp right at the beginning of covid and i think we we continue to try and pivot and, and, and try to bring the audience back um, to help them engage with the product as, as soon as we could. And that became what's now the WWE Thunderdome. We worked with um, a crowd called the Famous Group to bring an, a, this enormous virtual audience uh, experience together where we have you know, five, uh, 500 people who log in, um, who get into kind of a Zoom environment and, and get to see their face up on the walls around the, the stadium on. Um, on a Monday and Friday night for, for our shows. Um, I, and I think that's just indicative of you have to try, you have to pull every lever, you have to try, be willing to experiment with technology and you have to, you know, if, those who can, you have to be a little bit patient because it might not, might you might not get it right the first time, but really understand what you have and, and look, um, I think we're, we're blessed at WWE because we have a bunch of things that are working in our favor. Uh, we have an incredibly loyal following we have a, this bench of superstars, our talent, who are phenomenal and willing to try anything, and will and, and just crave connection with with our with our fans. So they're willing to make themselves available to try new things every single day. And um, and then we also have an archive. And I think leaning on our archive and understanding what people have connected with in the past and and making best use of that again to just keep keep us top of mind and, and remind them why they love what we do um, has been critical to keeping that audience engaged because I think they know that once, once we get beyond this, we'll be back um, bigger and better than ever. Yeah, no, it's fantastic and great story, great success story. Um, congratulations on it. So I uh, wish you continued success on that. Um, we're we're kind of hitting the, uh, the hour mark, so time to wrap up. We just had one or two quick questions. Um, so one was, what would Markham recommend to other media organizations that can film right now and need to keep their audience engaged? I guess, I guess we kind of just, just touched on that really. Um, but the second one was kind of, you know, we, we've spoken at length about some of your positions and how you were wearing many hats in those organizations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in your opinion, does it make sense to go deep in one area of your career or keep abroad, be a generalist? How do you, how do you kind of balance those th two things up? I've, I've found success and I've found fulfillment by being a generalist. I think uh, it's each to his own. You, you, you can certainly go either way, but you shouldn't be afraid of either path. And I think at one point in my career, I was definitely worried because 
I saw some of my peers and I saw other people who had gone deep in one area and and really focused and um, my career path was a little bit more winding. But, you know, the accumulation of skills and experience that I have, um, I wouldn't trade for anything else. And I think it positions me to be someone who can who can lead my team with a kind of really broad based experience and and draw on that for a lot of things, not just for um, for technical know-how or just uh, managerial experience, but just for resilience as well, because I've been through situations in a bunch of different organizations and places and um, it just sets you up well to be to, to cope with anything and be the kind of person who can pivot and who can say, you know what, you know, we'll get through this. It'll be, it'll be fine. And here's, here's three different ways that we can, we can figure out how to go forward. Um, so either is good. It's, it's just a matter of finding what's the fit for, for you and, and your personality type, I think. Virgil just dropped a quick question in the chat there as well. He said, uh, be interested to hear what, you know, your opinion on that is, uh, on U.S. versus uh, the Irish business culture, uh, startup world, and, and then he just said Israeli too. But uh, we just limited to the U.S. and, and Irish business and culture, maybe. I think um, <laughs> trying to be. And, and I guess you know, yeah, no, I guess we're saying this in the context of you know, we we at Digital Irish see kind of on a continuous basis Irish startups and Irish entrepreneurs coming over. Um, and sometimes, you know, making the same mistakes. So um, maybe what best can, you know, Irish entrepreneurs or those, you know, early out starting out in their career, uh, how best can they kind of take advantage of, of the US? What should they, they be doing when they're hitting the ground running here? Sure. I think one thing that um, has, has served me really well, um, and I think that this, anyone who's coming from Ireland to the state should know this, is that, you know, we're quite a direct people. I, do, I, I think that we're, we're willing to be frank and we don't like beating around the bush and talking a whole lot of you know, crap. Basically. I think Irish people get to the point very effectively, but do so in a way that isn't abrasive. And I think just owning that is a way to get to, to move forward. Uh, you know, at one point when I was thinking of leaving Vocative, I was talking to, to someone and um, just seeking a bit of advice on where to go. And he said, just first thing you should know is that being Irish, being Irish gets you 20% in this country. He said, "You're, you know, it gets you, it gets you ahead." And I think it's, um, we have a natural diplomacy, and we have a natural way of of, of looking at problems and, and being willing to, um, to to work with all comers to a certain extent. You just have to lean into. I think the difference is, you know, we're direct, and having worked with an Israeli company, they're direct in a very different way, uh, and. I think there's a kind of balance between they're probably one end of the spectrum and maybe the, the Americans that I've worked with are at a, at a different end of the spectrum. Um, you know, no, no culture is no culture is right or wrong. They're all just different. And I think what you have to do is you go in and eyes wide open um, and, and just literally, you know, like I, like, I, like I do everywhere I go, just see where you can make a dent and then figure out where the people are going to help you do it and, and the, the people who are going to be a hindrance, maybe avoid the latter. And I will say this was not my first rodeo. I'd, I'd worked when I was in my early twenties. I'd worked for an American company in in the Caribbean for three summers. So I got a taste of American culture. And my boss there, uh, this guy Mike Leist from Long Island, he used to hire maybe like a half dozen Irish among his staff of say fifty every summer. And he, you know, I got to be a program director there, fairly reasonably senior. And he said that he would get two you get two and a half Americans worth of work out of every Irish person you hired every summer. So that was comforting. <laughs> oh yeah. We've performance reviews coming up at work pretty soon. And that's a, that's a point I'm going to use for sure. <laughs> um, well, Markham, I think, you know, we've, we've reached our, our time limit. Uh, thank you so much for your time uh, this evening. Pleasure. Uh, we usually wrap up our evenings, you know, encourage our panelists to have an ask for our audience. Uh, indeed, we'd like to give you the opportunity to share your ask with the audience here as well. So I, I don't have any personal needs myself, but what I would like to, to highlight to people is it's a really tough time for anyone who's involved in fundraising, charity, trying to do good things and relying on the, on the generosity of others to get those done. And one person who um, was generous to me and, and uh, runs an amazing organization is uh, Will Galvin from Self Help Africa. And around this time every year, they would be running their 
Change Makers Bowl, which is a huge big event down in Chelsea Piers. And obviously they can't do it this year. Um, so what I encourage you to do is seek out their, um, their virtual change, change Makers Bowl, which is a phenomenal experience. And basically on November 13th, uh, for whatever your level of sponsorship is, they will provide you with uh, a box of tipple of your choice, red wine, whiskey, gin, wine, beer, and over Zoom for an hour, you will get the company of a sommelier uh, or an expert or a mixologist who will uh, kind of guide you through what's in your in your crate and how to make the best of it, which I think is a very clever pivot, a nice way of bringing people together, and uh, and also you get a get a drink out of it, which is always good. So oh, look great. them up, selfhelpactivate.org. Uh, and you'll be able to find it on their website. So it's, a, it's an amazing cause. Perfect. And uh, thanks to Fergal, he just shared it in the chat as well. So please make sure to check out South South Africa. Um, Mark, and my sincere thanks again. Uh, great to great to speak with you. Uh, is there a particular place place we can find you online, Twitter, or at, so? At Markham is always good. At Markham, I have reasonably good it. SEO, so you'll find me if you want me. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, we're going to move into the uh, breakout rooms for the next 10 minutes. Um, during that time, you'll have the opportunity to chat with other members of the Digital Irish community. Uh, we'd encourage you just to share what's going on uh, with you, with your business, or, or any asks you may have. Um, so again, thanks again to Markham. Uh, the breakout rooms will be about 10 minutes, and then we'll, we'll sign off.